Hello, I'm Sokam, welcome back to our second channel video. Today we're going to talk about referendums because they're a really hot subject these days, especially when it comes to the Britain exit of the European Union, also just known as Brexit. This was, of course, a big democratic referendum which happened in the UK, and this is something that a lot of people point to and say, well, there was a referendum. You can't go against the results of a referendum. But the truth is, although that's a valiant thing to stand for, and I understand why you might think that, it's not actually how referendums have been used in past by most countries, including the UK, actually. So let's talk about some referendums which have been re-ran or even in highly ignored because I find it to be a fascinating case study of what referendums really serve as a tool. So let's start by talking about the 1956 Maltese United Kingdom integration referendum. That sounds like a lot of words, but it was a referendum held in Malta, which at the time was a part of the United Kingdom's colonial possessions. And because of that, uh, you know, there was a referendum uh, within Malta to decide whether or not they wanted to become at their own independent country or whether they wanted to fully integrate into, uh, you know, the United Kingdom. So they held a referendum on integrating fully into the UK, getting its own seats in the House of Commons, getting, uh, you know, like the Home Office to take over, basically being a fully fledged part of the UK, just separated by all this distance, and on a turnout of 59.1%, 77% of the people that showed up to vote, of those 59%, decided to vote to become a part of the United Kingdom. So, the interesting thing about this referendum is you might say, wait a minute, Malta's not a part of the UK. It's a EU member state to this day that is very much separate to the UK. What's the deal with that? And the deal is that they decided off this because of a lot of internal tension with people who wanted to become a part of Italy or people who wanted to become independent altogether, uh, they decided eventually to ignore the referendum and they instead went independent. It's a move that at the time probably seemed like a fairly bad one because if they joined the UK, they could have had a huge boost to their wages, employment opportunities because of all the different you know, government offices, etc. They'd be a full part of the UK, so they'd be trade for, you know, tariff-free trade, etc. However, uh, you know, like in the long run, a Maltese independent has worked out for them because now they've got a lot of different uh, financial services, gambling, etc. they wouldn't otherwise have. And basically, as you can see, this referendum was just fully ignored. And that's just one example, because you also have examples of things like Switzerland. So Switzerland, this is a bit more like, you know, ignoring the spirit more than the name. Um, because a lot of people say like, well, there was a referendum, and you have to follow the spirit of the referendum. There's a democratic spirit inside all of us, and even on a small majority, you have to follow it. Well, Switzerland has shown that this doesn't seem to be the case. Despite Switzerland being one of the countries that people point to as an example of direct democracy in action, working all the time, actually, what ends up happening is a lot of the time, they vote for things that seem to be ignored in different ways. So basically, uh, you know, in 1992, Switzerland voted on whether they should join the EEA. This is the same place of the European Union that Norway and uh, Iceland are in, where they're not fully EU members, but they have a lot of the benefits and, uh, you know, some of the downsides, but not all of the downsides. And 50.3% uh, of the Swiss voters decided not to join the EEA. It was actually mostly in the French region. It was kind of like a French-German divide. But basically, more than half of the voters in Switzerland voted against during the EEA, but if you know Switzerland's current status, they're not technically in the EEA, but they're in the EEA in all but name. They have a bunch of treaties with the EU, which functionally give them the exact same, you know, powers, rights, regulations, etc. And it basically means that they ignored this referendum in everything but spirit. And then a second referendum, well, there's been a bunch of actually referendums on the EU uh, in Switzerland, most of which have been basically ignored. But basically, uh, in the 2014, they had a federal popular initiative against mass immigration, which would have stopped free movement of people from the EU. It was accepted by 50.3% of people. Again, a very, very tiny majority. But because of the fact that you literally can't be in the, uh, you know, the Schengen area without allowing free movement, that's a key part of how the whole thing works. As you can see, entirely ignored Switzerland. You can still move and work there from any EU country because this was a, you know, a populist referendum. It was an idea that people wanted to get behind. People loved the idea of sending out the signal, but it didn't work. It hasn't been implemented. And the same thing is basically true for the EEA. Again, Switzerland, uh, you know, as a country, that although they have direct democracy, they also know that a functioning democracy has a way to overrule or deal with certain things because, uh, you know, implementing certain uh, referendums, say, uh, you know, like a massive tax lowering, if you literally can't deal with that, then you wouldn't be able to implement it. And in a similar way, you need to have a government to actually implement the changes of a referendum. Referendums are great to gauge public opinion. They're a great way to have a fixed thing in the stone that you can work with, but it's not something that always means like referendum equals must happen. There, there is a link between those two things, which isn't always perfectly seen. And another example of this one, uh, to go into like re-ran referendums, is to talk about Quebec, which if you don't know Canada, which, uh, you know, I don't necessarily blame you, is often known as French Canada because it is the majority French-speaking uh, province of Canada. So what is the deal with Quebec? Well, because Quebec is so different to the rest of Canada, both on the linguistic level, which is very clear to see, but also on a historical or a cultural level, you can see how Quebec is kind of different to the rest of Canada. The reason that Canada is trying to develop this bilingual reputation, even though it's kind of mostly 
obviously not true, is because of the fact that there is a lot of French speakers. They almost need to appease in some ways, but to talk about Quebec and to talk about their referendum, because this is a video about those, uh, basically Quebec had a referendum on whether or not they wanted to be an independent country. And the first referendum uh, actually came pretty close. It was, uh, you know, within the margin of error. So they decided a few years later, we'll hold a second referendum. And that's weird because, get this, they voted to remain part of Canada and then they had a second referendum and that second referendum was going to overrule the first one. That's absolutely crazy, right? Get this, there is a second referendum because two separate pieces of democracy don't have to be, uh, you know, one doesn't have to override the other, one doesn't have to be entirely exclusive of the other. They were two different votes on the same different, uh, same issue, but with a lot of time in between which had changed their minds. And the second referendum came down to a real knife's edge. It was literally uh, less than a percentage point difference between the two sides. Uh, all it would have taken is a few tens of thousands of voters to shift, uh, you know, the balance from Quebec being independent to Quebec not being independent. And to me, that's kind of a wild thing. But then on top of the fact that Quebec went very close to becoming independent and changing the entire landscape of uh, how you see North America and maybe even the world, uh, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, Canada, we've actually seen their plans. Their initial plan was just to ignore any secession from Canada by Quebec. That was their entire plan to ignore the referendum, which is pretty shocking, right? They had a referendum and their plan was to annoy it, uh, was to ignore it. And I'm not saying this because I think these are right moves to do. They all are very complex issues. The point I'm trying to just raise all of these is that, oh, so as it turns out, because you did the thing in the past, it doesn't mean you're doing the thing in the present. To bring up one final example before we talk about the whole Brexit thing, let's talk about Norway and trying to join the EU. Because before Norway figured it would join the European communities, as it was known in 1972, they decided to hold a referendum. This referendum was, uh, you know, one which led to the government being defeated on a 53.5% to 46.5% majority. And basically it's like, okay, so we won't join the EU. However, in the next 20 years, situations change. So in 1994, there was another referendum where they also decided not to join what was then known as the EU. This was post Maastricht Treaty. But basically, that in 1994, Norway did not join the EU by a similar margin, actually. It was almost an identical vote, just with a lot more people in Norway. But you can see the point here that the status quo seems to win in a lot of these uh, referendums. When it comes to status quo versus something else, the something else needs to be clearly defined. And if it's not, and even if it is, uh, you know, it's possible to rerun the thing. The only reason there are more referendums on Norway for the EU or in Quebec for, uh, you know, like going independent or for, for instance, Malta joining the UK is because all three of those situations are very unlikely. Any politician knows that if they did a vote, it wouldn't go their way. And although you could, uh, you know, perhaps argue like in the campaign period, maybe this would change. No, the truth is, is public opinion is against those things and it doesn't suit those in charge to make them. Referendums are a tool used by governments as kind of just a way to say, look, we're not deciding this ourselves. We're not taking that hit. We'll have the democratic mandate as a backup to what we want to do to change the status quo. Or if we don't want to change the status quo, we want a defense for that. Um, and the best example of this, this is uh, where the video is kind of leading to, is the UK. So the UK has actually had very few referendums in its past. One of the very first ones that was truly nationwide was in 1975. And you know what the vote was about? It was about whether or not they should stay in the EEC. I'm saying they, we maybe. Uh, but it was a referendum of whether or not the UK should remain a part of the European Economic Community, which is the name for the EU. Again, it's got a lot of names based on when you're talking about history. Um, however, 67% of the UK electorate decided to vote in favour of staying in the EEC. In fact, it was a very left-wing position to want to leave the EU because, you know, that would mean that you'd be able to nationalise things a bit easier because the EEC was very much a pro-market organisation, still very much is a pro-market organisation. Pretty much any single thing you can look at, with some rare exceptions, uh, will come under the thing of like, this will help business in some way. So that is the point of the EEC, that's why it happened. And then in 2016, you might know this, this is where the video is leading up to, the UK had a referendum on whether or not to leave the EU. And the referendum was very clear in its results. There was a 51% majority in favour of leaving the European Union, and uh, because of that, the government started to work on the process of leaving the EU. However, in a you know, referendum as complex as something like leaving the EU, having a simple, oh yeah, like, would you like to be a part of it or not be a part of it, uh, has led to a lot of issues. Over the last couple of years, there has been non-stop negotiations about what UK outside the EU would look like, and there are so many different competing views. Everyone has their own separate slightly view, and this is where we left the situation right now, where despite all these different views being tried, all these different things trying to get out there, none of these different opinions has a majority. If you want to pass legislation in the UK, you need a majority, and nothing of the sorts happened. There isn't a, there isn't a majority for remaining, there isn't a majority for leaving without a deal, there isn't a majority for 
for leaving uh, with a you know specific deal which is being put uh, you know forth right now. There isn't a majority for leaving with any particular deal because it is very fractured. There is uh, we're in such a situation where there is no uh, you know 50 plus percent majority for any one option, which is why we get to the point that I want to raise right now, which is that people say, well, I mean, you could go back to a referendum, but that would be undemocratic. The people voted already. The people voted in 2016. Now you just got to implement the result. But the truth is, the difficulty is in working out how to implement that result. Uh, you know, you could argue have a second referendum, don't have remain on the ballot, just have different leave options. Maybe you want to do that. You could argue have a referendum, have it with uh, multiple stages on there. But the thing that I really don't like after looking at all of this is people who insist that democracy is a set in stone thing that you have to look at once and then never do it again. If you believe in your side of something has won, you should believe that it will win again. Uh, you know, if you like a government, you should believe they'll be re-elected in five years, as is, or four years, depending on your system, uh, because you think that they did a good job. If you think you only won because of a technicality, then you didn't really win a thing, and that's why I think you don't have a second referendum on anything, and you should get the same result. If you don't get the same result, that means something has changed for some number of people, and yes, I would say the people who are making such a referendum are using it as a power tool, using it as a way to uh, maybe project their view onto something, but because it's a referendum, it still requires people to vote on it, so either you think people are smart enough to make decisions, in which case, for as many referendums out there, you know, within reason, you know, one a year, two a year, but like, within reason, for as many referendums out there, and the people are smart enough to choose, or the people are not smart enough to choose, and they've never been smart enough to choose, and this has always been a, you know, like, a facade, which you've seen time after time after time after again, as you've seen in this video. I've made previous videos about lots of really ill-sighted referendums in past sight, such as, you know, like, Austria voted to be Anschluss by Germany, uh, such as a bunch of countries which voted to be independent, which you don't recognize today. But my simple point here is that referendums are just one part of a multi-layered democratic process, and uh, to look at them exclusively would be the same to look at the US system and say, well, I voted for a senator, and my, you know, the majority of the Senate wants this, but it's like, well, I mean, there's, you know, there's the, the, the House, there's the Senate, and there's the President, and there's the Judicial, it's, you know, checks and balances. And in the same way, in the UK system, even though we have referendums as a technical thing, uh, they are, you know, especially when they're advisory, they are ones to advise the Parliament on what to do next, to give them a backing to do something. You can't use them as a way to force people you also elected in a separate time to do something you don't want. If you don't like what they're doing, you can replace them later down the line. If you think you have a majority for your opinion, then you should be able to elect them into a majority in the next whatever. If you get 51% of people to vote for any party, it is very hard, it's technically possible, but it's very hard for that party not to get the majority to do what it wants to do. And yeah, my point of this video is just the fact that people who point to referendums and say they can't ever be overturned don't understand referendums or they're lying to you and I don't know which one is more deplorable. Referendums mean as much as you want them to mean. If they mean a lot, then you should have a lot of them because public opinion changes about all sorts of things all the time. And if they mean nothing, then you shouldn't have any of them and you shouldn't rely on any of the results to mean anything. But to have this kind of like pick and choose, because both sides are doing this. It's really annoying. If you want to remain, you're like, let's have another referendum, exactly the same rerun, uh, but you know, with this thing being different this time. Uh, if you're, you know, pro, uh, you know, leaving, you're like, actually, you know, referendums were great that one time, but never should we ever have one ever again on this one issue. At least not for like 10, 20, 30 years when we've left the EU and it's all wonderful. And it's like, well, I mean, Clearly, you need to pick a consistent opinion on what a, a referendum is, but that's not something people have done. Either way, hope you all enjoyed this video. It was actually edited by a guest editor, uh, so check the link in the description, which I've hopefully put there, if not I'm a terrible person. Or you can see his face on screen now, and you can also see a picture of a puppy, and you can also see a picture of the Angola flag, but the real Angola flag this time. So yeah, that's that's high quality editing. Thank you very much for watching this video. Remember to check the Reddit down below or the Flatter if you have an opinion. If you leave it in the YouTube comments, it's gonna be a dumpster fire. So check out the Reddit, leave your comment on this one. And for now, second channel, don't care. Goodbye.